Welcome to Screen Chat. My name is Marcella Toro. We chat to film and TV professionals about their experiences, stories and wisdom. My special guest today is Julie Eckersley, a creative producer and writer with over 20 years experience in the industry. From concept development, writing, script editing, financing, right through to post-production, international sales and marketing. From 2011 to 2020, Julie was a creative producer at the award-winning Matchbox Pictures, producing shows such as The Family Law, Glitch, Maximum Choppage, Oddlands, The Real Housewives of Melbourne, The Turning, and Anatomy 4. Julie's productions have received over 20 industry awards. Currently, she is a creative producer and a writer on a range of her own original concepts and is also working closely with several companies on development for projects for production. Julie Eckersley, welcome. How are you? (laughs) Hello, I'm good. Greeting from Melbourne where we're in um, stage four lockdowns. Oh, my word. Yes, yes, it's uh, it's a bit of a crazy time. Julie, from all the award-winning shows that you've actually produced, such as Glitch, The Family Law, Maximum Choppage, a huge list of credits to your name, how does it feel to have accomplished so much? Oh, well, that's lovely of you to say. You know, it's um, I'm really proud of every show I've worked on. I'm incredibly grateful and um, have loved every minute of it you know they're all shows that have so much to say and so much to contribute um but and it's it's so interesting in this industry because i always say it's a team sport so um when you ask how i feel about how i've accomplished it i feel like i've worked alongside great people um who've all worked really hard and put a lot of skin in the game and and um yeah so um i feel i feel grateful to have been part of fantastic teams making shows that that um, I'm proud of. Yeah, definitely. So when you actually started back in 2011, uh, on the first day, can you just quickly just give me a brief little rundown of how you, <laughs> what that day was like at Matchbox? Yeah, it was it was an interesting <laughs> journey. I would just done two years at Afters um, yes. doing the producing course and um Rob Connolly, who I'll be forever grateful to, was my tutor in the the second year. And uh, we were talking one day and he said, look, there's this great opportunity at this really young new company called Matchbox Pictures. And um, I know Michael McMahon and Tony Ayres and I can give him a call and tell him to talk to you about it. Um, And I was still at that point making the transition out of being an actor into being a producer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was was a that took a while for me to get my head around, to be honest, Marcella, because um, Mm. You know, I, I wanted to be an actor since I was four years old. Oh. Like it had been everything I've dreamed of and, and I loved it and yes. really enjoyed it. But just, you know, started to get itchy and wanted to do more and, you know, was really enjoying the producing side of it. So to go into Matchbox on that first day and, um, you know, be beside, you know, Michael McMahon there and Tony, two of the industry greats, was um, extraordinary. And I didn't really know what was ahead, but it was exciting. Very yeah so Xbox was also a really little company then you know uh-huh. i grew up with the the company nbcu hadn't invested then mm, um, mm. i remember you know, it was some months after i'd got there that they started being whispers around the corridors of this new thing that was happening and then it took a couple of years for nbcu to really come in and be involved in the company it's, just, yeah, it's incredible who would you say that are the most influential people that have assisted you to becoming the creative producer that you are today? Yeah, I think that's such a great question, actually, because, um, you know, we always stand on the shoulders of others as we are growing. And, um, you know, I think it's very important in this industry that as we are given opportunities, we give opportunities to others. Mm. And that kind of, you know, taking the hand that's given to us and also bringing people with us is part of how we make this industry work. Mm. Um, And I would say how we make the planet work. So I've Mm. been really lucky, obviously, Rob Conley for, you know, recommending me to Michael and Tony. Um, 
Tony Ayres and Michael McMahon have been extraordinarily good to me. When I first started working at Matchbox, everyone said to me, you were working with the good guys. And I was, and I still, you know, um, do have working relationships with them. And, and they also happen to be my neighbours. They live across the road. Um, so they've they've backed me time and time again. Then Chris Oliver-Taylor, when he mm. came into the company, again, someone I'm incredibly indebted to. And I know Chris is an extraordinary track record of doing that for so many people. Yes, um, amazing yeah. man. Yeah, and, and Matchbox is a company, I, I think, as well. You know, one of the things Matchbox does extremely well is they give you an opportunity and they don't micromanage you. So, you know, they mm. say, there you go, How, you mm. know, and you always come back to the safety of, we used to say, call them the parents, you know, the, the Helen Pankhurst and, and Chris and the people back at home base if you needed to. But other than that, you know, when I was given the opportunity to produce Maximum Choppage, which was my first um, scripted content mm. show, it's, you know, go for it. Yeah, and that's a great Yeah, that's really interesting that you say that micromanaged. Yes, I don't like being micromanaged at all. So because it's it's such a – so when you look at that and reflect back on that, given the film industry is, is dominated by males, how has that impacted your journey, if at all? And, um, and like you said, you weren't micromanaged. So that would have been much easier for you. Yeah, and um, look, I – all of the, most of those people that I've just listed, you know, they're obviously not the water, wider Matchbox team, but they're all men, like I mm-hmm. think um, all extraordinary men who've been extraordinarily supportive of me and, and many women. Um, I know that's not always the case um, mm. and I'm a big believer in women supporting women as well. I think that's something I really try and do um, now as I keep growing and, you know, I'm able now to offer opportunities to other people. Um, I really, um, diversity and you know, and looking at women is something that I really try and prioritise. But it, all those men have been amazing to me and um, it's great to see the slowly changing but the changing demographics of power as well. Mm-hmm. So would you say over the time that you worked at Matchbox, um, there must have been very many memorable moments uh, with them. So are you able to share a story or two for us? Let's um, see. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, we, we were in a story industry with amazing people, so there's, there's a thousand stories, some of which I'd probably be sued for sharing. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things I think was funny is when Sophie Miller and I um, worked very closely together, we were the producers on um, Family Law uh-huh. and, and also Maximum Choppage, and Sophie and I were sort of at the same level and we grew up together as producers um, and we were a really great double act on for quite a few years, and um, which is fantastic. When we were producing um, the first season of Family Law, um, uh, Sophie was pregnant mm. and um, uh, we were up in Queensland. She lives in Sydney, I live in Melbourne, and um, she was seven months pregnant and we were about to go into production. <laughs> she came into the office one afternoon and she said, having some really weird pains and it was her first baby and I was oh. like to a hospital and she's like I'll just drive home I was like don't drive home get in a cab like you know this could be it anyway she went to the hospital and she rang me and her partner was interstate as well he wasn't there so she's like um I'm just here and I'm getting monitored I'm not sure what's going on so I went to the hospital and I was like I'm gonna be your birthing <laughs> partner and, um anyway it didn't end up happening she ended up her partner got on the last plane out of town that night and then um uh, they went back to Sydney where she was able to have the baby, but that was I was nearly nearly able to be the birthing partner of my producing partner. <laughs> uh, it's, um, yeah, there's you know when I'm working with Lou Fox, who I was lucky enough to work with her and Tony really closely on Glitch, and Lou's an extraordinary woman, so smart, and um, she says so many brilliant brilliant things that I always quote back to myself. Even now, we haven't worked together for a couple of years, but one of the things she says is, you know, enjoy the champagne moments. Mm. And it's really true because you work so hard in this industry mm. and you, mm. even even the awards are sort of come and go, but mostly you're just onto the next thing and you're, you're knuckling down. And um, and so Lou is really good when we're on Glitch together at pulling us up saying, hey, let's let's just enjoy it for a minute. And often, you know, that would be really simple stuff to be honest. Like at the end mm. of a really big day of shooting, we'd just sit probably in a gutter at the side of <laughs> the side of set somewhere out in the wilds where we were shooting a lot of glitch um, and we just sit there, you know, in the night or 
at the side of the cemetery at 3 a.m. in the morning and just just take it in for a moment and mm. no, nothing in particular but just absorbing the fact that we were working really hard with amazing people and um, and here we were doing mm. what we love. That's, That's wonderful. Awesome. Yeah, cherish those moments. So memorable. Um, so now that you uh, have had all of that experience, you must have experienced many challenging moments. Can you just uh, tell us and walk us through that time and how you felt through those challenging moments, what you actually learned through those times as well, Julie? Yeah, that's true. There's a lot of challenges. In fact, mm. when people ask me what a producer does, one of my favourite <clears> things <throat> to say is we're professional problem solvers. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, that, that is a big part of the job is going, okay, what's going to come at me today and how, how do I, you know, walk through it and walk mm. my team through it. Mm. Um, I think one of the increasing challenges um, that's happening is this um, challenge of expectations and budget. And certainly, you know, with um, Glitch would be a good example of that, where we had such high aspirations and, you know, that show plays like all around the world on um, on Netflix and, and they don't know that we've got, you know, a third, a quarter of the budget that you know, the other show that they're watching right after us on Netflix has. Mm. And we, you know, we want to do work that we're proud of. That team wanted to do work that, you know, that they're proud of. So how do we how do we really reach those aspirations on smaller budgets? Mm. Um, and that's something, you know, as a creative leader that I think about a lot. And um, one of the ways that I address that is um, ensuring that the team has a really clear vision for the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that people have buy-in as well mm. um, because when you're asking people to go above and beyond, you want you want there to be real payment for people mm. and reward personal reward. Mm -hmm. In fact, Rob Connolly, when he was teaching me producing, um, said something so brilliant that is a real touchstone for me always um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a leader and producer. He said, every person who's working for you will have two reasons to be there. One of them will be financial, mm. so you know no brainer that you need to meet that as, as well as you can but there'll be a second one and it's your job as a creative leader to work out what that one is and try and meet that need and if you can meet that need and and listen to it and help that be addressed then you actually get loyalty within mm -hmm. your team so something I always try and do is is talk to everyone on my team and find out what that second thing is you know is it that they're trying to move to another department or they're trying to step up or um, is it that they have a family and they um, have hours that are challenging for them that we can accommodate or um, do they have a health challenge that we can support them with it can be anything mm. um, so I think trying to look for those ways when we can't always just throw more money at it to mm. really be creative in how we're taking care of our people, um, how we're offering them opportunities and also then how we're delivering the work. Mm. Like how can you think, about, how can you be really creative in how you um, address those the problems that, that come up? Yeah, okay. So it's really interesting because the producer's role is really to create an environment where the creative culture all thinks with that same vision and as you're actually going along, you need great chemistry. So how do you actually find those amazing people and know that you've got, uh, a, well, of course you would know, you know, from their credits and everything like that, you interview people, um, but, you know, to actually have, and, you know, to, to, to feel like you're all on the same page, how do you create that vision? It's, it's really, it's really fascinating to me. Yeah, it's it's a really big challenge. In fact, I've just been reading um, Creativity Inc., which is mm. by um, the, um, Ed Catmull, who runs Pixar. And oh, he yeah. talks about this exact thing. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, one of the things he really talks about is, um, is empowerment and mm. not micromanaging, and giving everyone ownership of the process. Yes. But also the communication's got a big part to do with that, yeah. um, that people need to know what that vision is um, on um, on family law and mm. on glitch. Um, I um, was really conscious of uh, creating um, a clear vision for that project. Like, yeah. here's what we're trying to do. Like, um, family law, you know, we're 
the early on it was this is a story of an Asian Australian family. This is the first time this has been done, you know, and that gives people an actual buy-in to what we're trying to do. Or in season three, you know, this is a story of a young gay Asian man coming out. And, you know, we are telling this so that people can, you know, um, can can see a story. You know, mm. we, we all know, you know, if you can see it, you can be it and the importance of those sorts of things. So, um so actually, actually being really conscious of what yes. what that is um, on a on a big level for the show on you know on glitch there were other similar challenges that we're trying to do so part of my job definitely is communicating that to the team and and creating an excitement um, that gives a vision to the show. Mm-hmm. It's really important when you say that sort of communication. It's it's yeah. so it sounds so easy. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it but- really and it's also. The people need to listen as well. So yeah, and also um, as um, Kevin says in the in creativity, Inc., you know, it's something you need to be vigilant about. Like mm. it's not something that's just done. You know, mm. the culture that you're creating, um, that would be something. You know, when I'm leading a show that's in full production, you know, and you can have hundreds of people there, that's something that I would think of and work on every day. And what happens between a group of people is a mm. chemistry. And sometimes you don't get it right and you need yeah. to address that. Um, and, you know, like you say, I mean, hiring and firing is part of the producer's role and, you know, mm. always uh, really challenging when, when you've got it wrong and you need to address it and, and you need to also protect the culture of the, the company while you're doing that. Mm. Um, but sometimes you just don't know what the what the magic is going to be like, you know, and it's great when it works, but when mm. it doesn't, it, it's tough. Yeah, of course. So what do you do? Do you take them out for a coffee, dinner before you hire oh. them or? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it depends on, I guess, I mean, some, you know, there are some people you've worked with, with on yeah. both Family Law and Glitch. Um, you know, we were really lucky that um, we had a really high returning um, rate of our key people. Yes. Um, so, you know, Emma Freeman we had on, you know, the whole way through um, as director. Um, there were only three apps she didn't um, direct. Um, same with Jonathan Bro um, directed season one of Family Law, but then we had you know Ben Chesswell on the next two. You know that kind of that that returning um, ma- makes it a lot easier because you've really mm, got- yeah but, yeah. In terms of people that are new, um, definitely getting references. I do lots of reference checking. Yeah, people can look great on paper, but actually. Um, when you've got them in that role, you know, there can be difficulties or challenges that come out that you haven't, you know, seen. So there's a pretty good um, rapport amongst fellow producers that mm. build each other up and, you know, often get calls from other people going, you've worked with this person, what do you reckon? You know, any warning signs? What do I need to look out for? Um, and, you know, that happens with crew and also with, with actors. Um, and, uh, yeah, but then sometimes it's a combination of people, you know, and, and things just don't go right but we look we've got amazing crews and amazing cast in australia so mostly people are amazing and hard working mm. and get yeah. the job done yeah we're very lucky now let's deep dive into the core of what a producer tv producer does <laughs> if you can un- order <laughs> yeah get ready <clears throat> um yeah. so let's unpack your role it's such a big responsibility it's huge uh, can it you just go through, job. pardon? It is a very big job, that's true. Yeah, yes. So are you able just to unpack the responsibility of work that you do, please? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I think the best way to think, uh, look, there are lots of different producers, I'll just say that, and then, yeah. you know, executive producers can be different to producers and then associate producers or line producers. Um, uh, obviously, a for if anyone who's watching doesn't know, a line producer is um, mainly runs the budget and the um, crew contracting, um, and that's an essential partnership alongside producing. Whereas producing is more overarching, and say an EP like um, Tony Ayres or Lou Fox is the, the next layer up, particularly concerned with the creative. But that EP role can also be different. Some EPs are um, more financially involved. Mm-hmm. Um, but a producer and an, an everyday run of the mill producer really. Um, is mostly involved in five stages of production. Well, I certainly am in terms of the, the long arm of things, mm. um, something later. But often I would come across an idea or um, be introduced to an idea when it's just a couple of pages long or it's a book. Um, so it's a twinkle in someone's eye. So the first stage is development. 
Mm-hmm. And that's really, you know, when the project resonates with you, it's it's getting involved in developing up that story, really starting to find the um, the voice of it, the world of it, um, getting uh, pitch documents ready, bringing on really early writers and things like that. Um, once you've got that documents, those sorts of documents ready, um, and then you're moving into pitching, that's part of that is financing. So I'd say that's the second um second round Mm. and at that point you've done a budget um, and a finance plan so a budget being all the costs involved that you can see at that point which is really hard to do because often you're doing that off one script Mm. so how do you preempt what you're going to need for six episodes when you're doing it off one script Mm. Um, and the finance plan is all the different places that you need that you think you're going to need to go to get the money so say the budget was a million dollars which would never be that low. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, you, you might go, okay, well, you know, 20% of that's going to be the um, producer's offset, which we have in Australia, which is 20% of any um, budget that um, uh, can, meets those requirements. Mm. And then, you know, you might think that you can get um, 5% off Film Victoria and 10% off Screen Australia. And then you're looking for a, um, a license fee from a broadcaster and, and maybe some international sales. Um, obviously, that's changing a lot with the, the streamers now. So mm-hmm. you're then trying to make that work. How mm-hmm. can you raise, raise the money that mm-hmm. you think you need um, to make the show? So financing mm-hmm. second stage. Then once you've got that money in place um, in Australia, that then you're greenlit. Um, again, this is this is all for Australia. I know these things can vary. Sure. Different. Um, and then you're heading into pre-production and production. So then you're crewing up and casting and you've got your production dates and um, so then you have your period of production, which is the most exciting and the most stressful and the most expensive. <laughs> like money is flying out the door and, you know, your budget's um, going wild at that point, so you need to hold the reins on that but also get the best quality you can and, and that you're managing lots of people and, you know. Um, and yeah. then once you finish shooting, mm-hmm. you're wrapped, you then go into post-production. Mm-hmm. And some of that might have started, would have started while you're shooting, that you're starting the edit. So then you go through the process of editing it, of putting the music in, of doing sound or ADR, mm-hmm. um, which is more dialogue recording. Um, you're doing VFX. Um, then once that's all done, you're grading the picture and then you're putting it all together and you're delivering it. And when that's delivered, the fifth stage is marketing. Uh, so then you're, um, uh, you know, how, how do you help the show be promoted? And depending who your partner is, um, you may or may not get network support with that. Um, even if your show is with the ABC, the ABC grade their shows. So some shows get some really good um, marketing support and others don't. Obviously, mm. they have resources to give that to everyone. So, mm-hmm. um, but now more than ever, um, I think, as, as shows are playing internationally, like Netflix internationally most likely won't be giving you much, if any, marketing support mm. because, um, you know, they unless it's a really high-profile show, uh-huh. uh, you as a producer, you know, want that show to get out to as many people as possible. So certainly on, on the shows that I do for streamers, um, working in conjunction with the streamers, but um, I'm running... Um, marketing campaigns globally through social media to get that show out as far as possible so it's a pretty pretty long journey you have with a show and that's that's years you know that's a long long period of time so Mm. I really love the work definitely so let's just go back to the finance so can you just tell me my my daughter actually loved nowhere boys (laughs) Um, and just one episode how much does it cost just for one episode or well, look to that's produce the best show, and that's probably something I well I, I wouldn't I couldn't probably talk to that, and I, to be honest, I don't know the exact details of that yeah. because um, Beth Frey produced that show. Yes. Um, uh, but um, it, All right. if you're looking, if you, I, I can give you some broad range. Yeah. Of things. If yeah. You're looking at sort of a half hour comedy, um, which that probably is around you know a half a million dollars per episode now. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking at the one-hour drama, um, the, that's probably one and a half million upwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, if, it's a, if it's a really big show with lots of lots of VFX or lots of historical elements, it would be much more expensive than that. Um, but that's probably your starting 
um, your starting dollars. And just to give you an idea of what you have to do in terms of the finance plan, um, if you sell that to, say it's an, a one hour drama for the ABC, mm. the um, license fee they'll give you to play that in Australia out of your one and a half million per episode that you need to raise, mm. they only give you 440,000. So that's nearly a million dollars per episode you've got to find elsewhere. That's quite mm. a gap. It is. And that's getting bigger and bigger, which is why, you know, you talk to people like Chris Oliver Taylor, who are extraordinary at raising money um, for, for shows. Um, that's um, an in increasing um, superpower um, because there's so much of a gap that needs to be raised um, to make just to get a show happening. Yes. Now, just, just really quickly, with the casting process at the end, who makes the final decision? Is it the director and the producer who actually make yeah. the final decision yeah. on the yeah. casting? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So the casting agents, um, their job, and you work really closely with them, and, you know, Alison Telford on Glitch, extraordinary, and um, Tom McSweeney and Dave Newman that we worked with on Family Law, amazing. They went, like, particularly on... When we started casting Family Law, so many people said to me, um, and Sophie too, you will not find that cast. You will not find enough Asian actors who are good enough to um, to make that show work. And you know what? We did. We did, and, and an abundance of them. And um, it was such a testament to the talent that's out there and the mm. who didn't they were come, you know, that we just yes. hadn't seen these because the shows, the roles hadn't been there. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, so so um, Tom and Dave did an extraordinary job in that instance of just going, where, where do we find people who've never had a chance to audition before? How mm -hmm. do we open those doors? So casting agents are great at getting people in the doors, and they will often recommend someone to you. They look, oh, you know, you, um, they might see thirty people for a role. They might, they probably will send them all to you. They might say, hey, I've put my top eight at the back. Mm -hmm. And the last one is the one that I reckon you're going to love. They'll give you that recommendation. But then the directors and the producers um, watch, the setup director and the producer watch that and, and mm. cast from that. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, no, Tom McSweeney, David Newman are amazing. Alison Telford, sensational. Um, all right, so just um, now that we're in this situation, um, you know, in the COVID-19 and everything, we've... It's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's causing a lot of havoc in the film and television industry. As a creative producer, uh, you're now alone, independent. What do you see the, the future or how do you see the future? Yeah, I don't think anyone knows what the future is right now. Mm. Um, I don't think we can say what, what's going to happen. Mm. Um, I think what's been great about now is that um, there's been time to develop a lot of work and I'm really excited when all the work and it's been able to have mm. real time to it starts to come out into our screens in you know hopefully a year or two yeah um, I think that our like particularly in Victoria film Victoria and Screen Australia and I'm sure it's the same in other states but I just don't know have done uh, an extraordinary job of pivoting their funding and coming back to really developing new work um and abc of course have had some amazing initiatives um so i think i think that's been great i i'm concerned if this keeps going on how long that development juice can last and that's mm. a lot of people over this period and but you know we mm. need to get back to production um with victoria in stage four i see that they still are allowed to shoot because again our screen agencies have done a really great job of putting really stringent guidelines into place but yes. it's not as it was it's more expensive it's less crews there's big changes that need to be made so i guess we're going to have to go on like that for now um and mm. then yeah look moving forward i um i was listening to this um podcast from a really great showrunner in la um called simon mirren the other day and he was talking about the future in a really exciting way he was saying you know look we no, none of us could have like um could have foreseen that this was going to happen, you know, COVID, but also alongside that Black Lives Matter, that actually this call to action of saying enough is enough, mm. like this needs to change. There is, you know, and um, he was looking from an American point of view, but I think it, it's in Australia as well at that, saying now is the time more than ever 
to really invest in young new voices. Okay. To really let those distinct new voices come through. Mm. That, that we're ready that it's time, that it's the right thing to do, but it's also what there's an appetite for. And there's Mm -hmm. a whole generation coming through who really anyone aged sort of 12 to 25, they've grown up on different content to anyone before them. You know, they've grown up on streaming, they've grown up watching global content. So I'm excited about what stories they're going to create and what level they have in their head. So who knows what the future holds but there's some exciting possibilities for sure Mm, definitely well you know i'm very excited to know what our audience actually is uh wanting to ask here so i'm just going to read out a few um messages (laughs) for you julie um david john clark says love watching everything from matchbox perry print says what great advice crystal stevens says what would you suggest for those considering starting out in the creative producer industry yeah great crystal um that is a really great question what i always say to people um is a couple of things um be prepared to go backwards before you go forwards I've changed careers a couple of times um, and uh, I think that, um, well, Marcella, for example, what you're doing, you've just, mm. you've found an opportunity for yourself that you're mm. producing this and you went, you know, I want to be a producer, I'm just going to start producing something. That's right. You haven't, haven't waited for someone to pay you to, you know, um, give you some big television show because that that that's part of the journey. So you need to be prepared to do the steps. Yes. Um, I think... There's a great book I read years ago called Think and Grow Rich, and it talks about how people thrived in the depression, which I think is really timely for us now because, you know, who knows what's happening. One of the key things that stuck in my brain is um, the people who thrived in the depression were people who looked for the opportunities Mm. and the opportunities where there was a need. So a lot of people, so many people email me or email Matchbox saying, can you give me this? I want this. Yes. Um, truth is how I started at Matchbox and how um, I kept myself hanging around in those early days was I did exactly that. I went, okay, where's the gap in this company? There's a lot of amazing, really experienced producers. But you know what? At that time, and this is 10 years ago, social media and television was really new and no one was using it. There were never Facebook Mm. pages for shows and things like that. But I could see that that was a growing market. I could see that was something that we could really do and soon after I got there the slap started and so I said to Matchbox why don't I make a whole lot of social media clips and um, put them on Facebook and um, with a guy called Fahim together we put together a a strategy a social media strategy Mm -hmm. and actually early on when I went from being an intern to Matchbox the first role I had was a multi-platform producer and Mm -hmm. then from then I um, created and put together and financed um, a multi-platform strategy for Matchbox, uh, for um, Nowhere Boys One. Mm. And so I think that, you know, finding that opportunity is is a really good thing. Mm. Um, you can, when you're reaching out to people, the other thing that I think is really important is like, do you research and, mm. and be creative? Like of all the people, again, I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of people who emailed me at Matchbox, mm. you know, saying, can I take you for a coffee or something like that, to be honest, I mean, that, that that's a big ask, you know, when mm. you're that big to, to go for a coffee. But um, if someone had said to me, for example, um, just emailed the front desk and said, what's Julie's favourite coffee? Soy latte. And then... Um, <laughs> um, and then um, You're going to so get about 100 soy lattes yeah. now. <laughs> well, and then, and then said, for example, this is another way of thinking about it, right? And then said... Um, Julie, I'd love to bring you a soy latte, and while you take five minutes to drink it, I'd love to. I'd love to talk to you about X. Yeah, you know, you can think of other ways to do it. Both, and yeah. then when you come in the door, the other part of that is make sure you've done your research. Yeah. Like, don't just come in and um, sort of say, "Oh, you know, um, you know, I watched, um, you know, um, uh, Safe Harbor, and I loved it." Because I mean, that's great that you love Safe Harbor, and it, so you should love it. It's a fantastic show, but it's not a show I produced. So it's really easy to get information. So when you get that opportunity, um, mm. 
you know, actually do your research and make the most of it. Tony Ayres has this really brilliant thing he says, actually, and Tony is someone who, you know, very powerful, extraordinary man who's given a lot of people an opportunity, but he says Mm -hmm. you get one opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if you mess up, you never get it again. Scary. to be honest, well, it's scary, but it's also fair enough, you know. There's a lot of people out there. So when you get that opportunity, just Mm -hmm. absolutely work your guts out. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that answers Good advice. Crystal, no, it's amazing. Um, I'm happy to happy to ask more. The other thing would be just try doing get get yourself doing it in any way you can. You know, like Marcella, I think that's a really important thing as well. Don't wait for the opportunity; create the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, um, Adele Schobart, Tom McSweeney, Love Heart. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we love Tom McSweeney. Elizabeth Parisi, as a producer, how do you make sure the original idea in brackets or kernel doesn't change into something completely different throughout the development process? That is an excellent, excellent question, Elizabeth, and I think a really key part of being a producer. Um, I One of the ways I really make sure I do that is I come in as early as possible and um, I would, I'm in as many creative rooms as possible. Mm. So um, when I, um, you know, on Glitch, you know, I'm, I'm not a writer, you know, I'm giving notes on scripts, but I was in every room I could be in because when I'm sitting there and I'm listening to Lou and Tony and, you know, Pete McTighe and Gila, like building the story, I then understand right from the foundation why it's important. And that means that when, you know, when we're in production and, you um, difficult decisions need to be made I'm made I'm in a much better place of going no 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 that can't be changed because I understand the root of where it came from Mm. the other thing that I've had great success in doing and really love doing is both on glitch and family law and and maximum trophage I worked with a showrunner yep so glitch that showrunner was Lou Fox and um family law and max chop it was Sophie Miller and how we worked out, that's a kind of, not many people in Australia do that. It's very popular in LA, but I love it. And one of the ways that that's really worked is that we then divide and conquer. So I would, you know, with Lou and Sophia, I said to them, look, let me let me take everything off your plate except creative, right? So all you need to focus on is story and creative decisions. Like if you need to know anything about budget or management or whatever, I can, it's, or it's like we're a team, there's no mm. secrets. It's there, but, you know, I want your brain to be clear to do that because that is the heart of it, that is the key of it. And, you know, both of those women are exceptional at doing that. So that's another way um, that's really practical because there's so much coming at you at production. And to be honest, I don't know how you really defend the story unless you've got a warrior in the role of showrunner doing it. I think um, I think it's, I think it's pretty hard. Mm. So... Yeah, um, that's a couple of strategies I've found that are really good. Wonderful. All right, Rosie Trainer from oh, Chameleon Rosie. Casting. Hello, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't she gorgeous? Um, how has your experience as an actor informed your role as a producer? Oh, I love that question. You know what? Um, I was talking to Marcella about this the other week, saying that one of the things I realised when I became a producer is how scared producers are of actors. Um, because you know there, there is this sense that these actors are fragile things and similarly when I was um, studying producing one of the courses that we had to do was called managing creativity and I realized that as an actor I'd been managed my whole life and I didn't realize so um, yeah. I think um, I think understanding that um, like I think it, it really has given me an understanding of um, how vulnerable actors are And the less I am an actor, the more I absolutely appreciate and honour how vulnerable and generous it is to be an actor. Mm. Um, So hopefully um, that's helped me um, really focus on empowering actors. Um, One of the things I used to find as an actor was I'd finish shooting a show and I'd never hear anything about it again and then all of a sudden it would be on air. So um, with mm. all, of, all of the, you know, key cast, maybe not a, a ton of well, but nearly everyone in the cast, um, I create an email list after I finish shooting and I keep them updated. And I do it for my crew as well because it's their show. They made it. And um, when we get closer to shooting, I will give my cast um, 
photos of themselves, information, all sorts of things that they can post on their social pages about the show that helps promote their career as well as promoting the show. Mm. Um, but again, it just gives them ownership of it as well so that they're not just sitting there one night and suddenly seeing their show on, like happened to me so many times as an actor, <laughs> and, and not feeling like you had any part of it, sort of mm. <laughs> feels good. Um, yeah, um, so, so yeah, they're, they're, that's something that I really have taken on board. Um, um, uh, maybe a compassion both ways for what the other's going through. Similarly, I think I was really, even though I'd been on sets for so long, Rosie, like, you know, and um, uh, that I was really surprised at all the stuff that <laughs> a producer did that I never knew. Like, and, and also how much the producer is watching the actors mm. and, and holding them, you know, that managing creativity thing. Like the actors are really important. It's important that they're there, that they're in a good headspace, that um, they've got what they need, that they're happy because them delivering is key to the show being great. Mm. So um, that was a real eye-opener for me as well. Wonderful. Alice Sinclair says, hi there. Thank you so much for this chat. It's really interesting. I'm wondering if you're currently looking for any new ideas to develop. If so, if is there anything specific you would like to see? That's a great question too. Look, mm -hmm. I mean, any producer is always looking for great ideas. Um, I think I love what, um, if you go back and look at the um, last interview that Marcella did with Chris Oliver-Taylor, he's got a really great way of saying it. It's actually also what Matchbox sees in terms of the structure of ideas that they're looking for because I think I don't really think there's any um benefit in sort of saying oh you know I want a crime drama or I want this or I want that you know I could give you some guidelines really high level but that changes all the time to be honest and I think most people me and every network doesn't know what they want until they see it but mm. you know Chris three things about a really strong idea strong IP a writing team that can actually deliver on the idea um, and that could be amazing new talent or, you know, it could be amazing new talent with someone else, but actually knowing how it, how it can be delivered and then a path to market, like knowing how to get to market. They're, they're the practical things. And that's Chris's advice at Fremantle and that's also Matchbox's advice, that whenever we pitch an idea, we had to have those three things in place. In terms of the global market, what I'm loving at the moment, what I feel is really more exciting than ever is that the market wants and can hold really clear um, IP that is specific. So some of the shows that I'm watching at the moment um, really deliver on this beautifully. For example, um, Queen Sono, which is a South African show about a, a South African African woman who is um, kind of a, an everyday superhero. She's, um, uh, she's an agent. And she is kick ass, and it's really mm. she speaks. It's partly in Afrikaans, partly in English. It's mm. very specific to Africa and South Africa. And um, you know, I heard the head of Netflix talking about it the other day. Like that is such a great show. Or there's, um, and it, it's very specific. Like five or mm. ten years ago, you would have said, "Oh, that'll never travel," but now it does. In fact, someone said to me just this morning, one of mm. the reasons we're loving those things is because we are traveling more than ever through our shows. So shows that are specific are great. I was working the other week with um, a, a great comedy team um, who are writing a show in Brisbane. And one of the things I got them to do that I think really helped make the show distinct was to define what Brisbane they're looking at. So, you know, Sex and the City, for example, is set in a specific New York. You know, that's that's a specific version of New mm. York. So if you're going to set your show in Brisbane, what specific Brisbane are you setting it in? So I think I think that that, th that shows that are really distinct in terms of the worlds that they're in um, and the voice that they have uh, are, are more important now than ever. You know, and I would add to that, like, you know, if you just at that kind of at the more general level, like if you, you want a really clear concept, a compelling world, compelling characters, you want it to be genre satisfying um, and you want it to have meaning. Like you want to know what your show's about. Yes. So, you know, um, when I'm when I'm working with, with teams as a, as a script producer, um, I get them to define their North Star and that is, you know, what, what's your true North for your show? And, you know, how, how do you, is this a show? Oh, it's a show about grief. Okay, but what specifically about grief are you saying? What are you saying? Um, that is specific to that show. What what is the heart of the show? Mm. And um, my writing teacher Corey Mandel, he always says that um, uh, 
writing is an energy transfer business. And if, and if you put heart into it, heart will come off the page. So, but you need to know what the heart is that you're putting into it for that really to work. And, and those distinct shows are just what's cutting through right now. So make it distinct, make it you, make it you. If you had one thing to say to the world before you die, what would you say? Make it that sharp, make it that passionate. Mm. Amazing. Okay. Apana um, Barachi, well done, Marcelo Toro. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Apana. Um, Crystal Stephen again. So, so she says, thanks very, thanks for this very informative. Yeah, so... Thank you so much. This is wonderful. We've actually gone over time. I'm very sorry for going over time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining in. It's, you know, this is such a, a community and now more than ever. And, you know, if, if one of the things I'm personally loving about this time is all the amazing online learning that there is. So if, if you're interested in online learning, I just wanted to mention a couple of the other places that I'm loving getting information um, at the moment. If you go to the Sundance Collab website, Mm -hmm. um, and that's got incredible masterclasses. I just did one the other week that um, is from the creator of uh, one of the executive producers of um, of, of Sex in the City. Um, mm -hmm. And you can, there's a whole lot of them there that you can do for free. Um, there's Michael Michael Arndt who's um, did Toy Story. There's a great thing on writing feature, features that he's done about how to write Toy Story 3. Um, one of my favourite podcasts at the moment is um, uh, called This Screenwriting Life. And it's mm. by two Pixar women. And it's just every week, if you're a writer, they just talk about the challenges of being a writer and they give really practical information. But, you know, there is so much brilliant learning for free out there right now. So Sorry, what was that podcast in, called again? It's called The Screenwriting Life. The Screenwriting Life. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. So um, anyway, it, yeah. uh, if it's, I can send you some links um, if you want to put yes. them up underneath this link for, for people yeah. to click on this is a great time to grow and strengthen your skills so that you come out of this the best creator that you can be and whatever you're passionate about definitely sorry uh we've just got two more um one comment and one question is that okay julie of um i'm in lockdown i'm not going anywhere <laughs> exactly okay nanette navero great discussion and q a interesting information in the creative producer industry thank you marcella and julie Perry Prince. Hi, Julie. So lovely to hear from you. You mentioned the kind of finance the ABC might contribute. How does this apply to Netflix? At what level would Netflix Australia get involved in series and to what financial capacity? Oh, that's a really big question. And I think uh, it's a great question, but it's a bit of a how long's a piece of string. Mm. Um, I think that, um, I mean, Glitch um, was the first show that Netflix invested in, in terms of rights. And what they purchased for that was they purchased, it's called Rest of World. So rights uh, um, have been tradition, again, this is all changing, traditionally broken up into Australia and New Zealand, which you can sell for a certain amount of money, depending on the show, and then Rest of World rights. Now, what those rights are valued at is there's no set amount. It's kind of like um, buying a piece of art. You know, it's what what is it? Um, what's the perceived value of it? So, for example, if you're doing a show like Stateless, you know, with Kate Blanchett attached, that's got a perceived value. If you're a new talent and it was, um, you know, an offbeat comedy, that's going to have a different perceived value. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, in terms of um, so, um, Cumin Lou's just joined um, the Australian Netflix team, and I think people are waiting to see what that changes in terms of if Netflix um, starts putting money into developing things. Mm. Um, again, it's still changing, but traditionally in Australia, they haven't really put money into developing things. So often you're finding money elsewhere to go to them with a pitch document and a pilot script. Mm -hmm. um, that could be, you know, Film Victoria or self-financed, not great, um, or, you know, Screen Australia. Um, and then once you've got them, you know, They'll, they'll come on board to take you into production. Um, but, yeah, they haven't. But, you know, you might also know, sorry, I'm jumping around a little bit, but you might also know that there's a big push by um, the Australian government and by the Screen Producers Association and, and lots of the key bodies in Australia to get um, the streamers who are doing business in Australia to have quotas the way that the television networks have. Um, so 
um, if it, just in case you don't know that to to have a broadcast license in Australia, you need to agree that you will um, create and, and and finance a certain amount of Australian work mm. um, in drama and kids television and things. Um, so they're trying to get that law for uh, all the streamers that are in Australia, which is really important because we're just a little market, and without mm. that demand, um, it's very hard for us to stay afloat. So um, yeah. So sorry, I'm, I'm not true. No, the answer to the question really is a little bit how long is a piece of string. But your best places to get development money um, would not be going to Netflix. It would be going to places like if you're in Victoria from Victoria or Screen New South Wales or your state body, and then looking at Screen Australia. And right now, and this is um, probably going to change any minute. Um, they usually you need what's called broadcast interest to get that money, which means you need a letter from ABC or SBS or Channel 7 or whatever to say, oh, we really love this show, we're really excited about it, if only you'd give it some development money. And then, you know, you can take that to Screen Australia and then that triggers the money, um, mm -hmm. proving that someone's actually interested in it. Um, but a lot of um, the funding that's coming through at the moment, they've put that aside right now to allow extra development money to, to come through. So, um, yeah, but I'd suggest going to them before going to um, a broadcaster for development money. Unless, you know, ABC obviously develops some things. Mm, mm. That oh. answers your question. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Oh, thank you so much, Julie, for your time. It's been an absolute blast. <laughs> Stay safe, everyone. It's a tough yeah. time. Help yourselves and your loved ones and use the time your best you can. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, everybody, please share. Please uh, give it a thumbs up here and um, we will see you next time. Stay safe, like Julie just said. Uh, stay home <laughs> and all the best. All right, Julie, thank you so much again. Thank you. See you. Bye.